Good afternoon. Welcome to the Analyst. Today we'll be taking up five newspaper articles from the Hindu and the Indian Express and discussing them. The handout for the same will be available in the description of this video for your kind perusal. Please have a look at that. The first article that we'll be taking up today is related to reservation. As the Bihar government has proposed to increase the reservation for SC, ST, OBCs in the state to 65% from the current 50% ceiling. So we'll be talking about the rationale, the evolution and the judicial decisions regarding reservation. The second article is related to stubble burning. As the Supreme Court has directed the states of Punjab, Haryana, Uttar Pradesh and Rajasthan to immediately curb the stubble burning. The third article is related to the imports of Russian oil as the cheaper rates of Russian oil has helped the Indian refiners save about $3 billion and it will help in reducing India's current account deficit. The fourth article is related to discoms as a couple of discoms in Delhi have received show cause notices over pending payments. And the final article is related to Democratic Republic of Congo, where there is a massive internal displacement of people within Congo, in the eastern province of Congo, that is North Kivu. Now, the first article is related to reservation. As the Bihar cabinet has approved a proposal to increase reservations in the state for SC, ST, OBC and extremely backward classes to 65% from the current 50% ceiling, which has been set by the Supreme Court in the case Indra Sani versus Union of India. This is important in the paper GS2, Welfare Schemes for Vulnerable Sections and also as a case study in GS4 Ethics 2. Now, before moving on, let's look at the philosophical aspect behind reservation or why it is needed in India, why the diversity in society needs reservation. One school of thought even says that it is like an anti-poverty measure, but no. Reservation was introduced by the framers of the constitution within the constitution to cure the historical discrimination which was faced by certain sections in the society, SCs, STs, etc. Now, it is not a poverty alleviation scheme. Even the Supreme Court has observed multiple times that the economic standing in the society cannot be a sole criteria for determining the backwardness of a class or for providing reservation. Another school of thought even says that it is merely providing a right of access and it is not a right of redressal, etc. But the Supreme Court observed again in, for example, Gulshan Prakash versus State of Haryana case that reservation cannot be awarded like a matter of right. This is merely an enabling provision. The Articles 15 subclause 4, the Article 16 subclause 4 in the Constitution contained in the fundamental rights. They are merely enabling the state to provide for a reservation policy. They are providing that discretionary power to the state. And that discretionary power of providing reservation, which is provided to the state, that is the government, that should not be unregulated, uncontrolled. For example, in M. Nagaraj versus Union of India case, the Supreme Court observed that reservation can be provided by the state at its discretion, provided it is considering certain factors. For example, the backwardness of a class. The administration efficiency should not be impacted and the class is inadequately represented in the state services, etc. So such parameters have to be taken into consideration. So it is not a matter of right, but rather an enabling provision as per the Supreme Court. Also, when we look at the Indian society, it is so diverse. The John Rawls concept of social justice is particularly applicable in the context of Indian society. Rawls says that there should be equality. There should be an equality principle and equality cannot be compromised. But at the same time, Rawls also gives a difference principle. He says that people cannot be seen through the same lens. Everybody comes from a different background. Everybody comes from a different standing. Now you cannot treat them equally. A sort of affirmative action is also required to ensure that there is equity in the society. Otherwise, that equality will be looking at equality in a very narrow sense. We'll be having a myopic point of view of equality if we are not ensuring equality in a broader sense, if we are not ensuring equity in the society through affirmative actions, for example, reservation. So it's a kind of a positive discrimination where some people, they are treated specially because they come from a backward background, right? 
Now, what are the aims for reservation? For example, if you observe the language of articles 15 sub clause 4 and article 16 sub clause 4, they itself say that the government can make special provisions for the advancement of socially and economically backward classes or if they are inadequately represented in the state services in public services then special provisions can be made by the government to ensure that there is adequate representation these are the aims it is not a poverty alleviation scheme per se and there is a legitimate aim of the state ensuring development with justice but unfortunately sometimes what happens is there is vote bank politics which is resorted to by the governments by state governments also and they use caste surveys etc and then proposals for reservation which are not in line with the constitutional philosophy at times now when we are going to give opinions regarding such debatable issues we'll be trying to make sure that our opinions our suggestions they are in line with the supreme court judgments before moving on to the judicial interpretations let us look at the constitutional provisions the articles in the constitution which provide for reservation first article 15 and 16 they provide for special provisions which the government can make article 16 provides for the equality in matters of public employment which the state has to ensure but 16 sub clause 4 at the same time empowers the government that it can make special provisions it can make reservation provisions for the advancement of socially and economically backward classes and 15 sub clause 4 provides for maybe admissions to educational institutions etc now after the 77th constitutional amendment act in 1995 article 16 sub clause 4a was also inserted into the constitution 16 sub clause 4a provides for reservations in matters of promotion that is in matters of promotion also reservation will be provided to SCs, STs etc. After 85th constitutional amendment act 2001, 16 sub clause 4a was amended to read that consequential seniority will also be taken into account when reservation in promotion is provided. Now again this is a discretion which is awarded to the government that the government can make such provisions. Under the 81st Constitutional Amendment Act in 2000, Article 16 sub clause 4b was also inserted into the constitution which provides for a carry forward rule. Now what is that carry forward rule? It essentially means that reservation if the reserved posts are not filled then they can be carried to the next year. Now the reserved vacancies which are carried forward to the next year they will not be clubbed with the regular vacancies of the subsequent year they will be treated as a separate class of vacancies therefore the total number of vacancies to be filled in the subsequent year there the total 50 percent limit will apply for only the regular vacancies of that year the previously reserved vacancies which were carried over to the next year there the 50 percent rule will not apply all of them can be reserved posts then articles 243d and 243t they provide for the reservation for scs and sts in the panchayati raj institutions and urban local bodies also then article 330 and 332 they provide for reservation in parliament and in the state legislative assemblies for the scs and sts whereas article 335 says that when reservation is provided to certain sections in the society then administrative efficiency should also be taken into account that is reservation to is to be provided to such an extent up to which administrative efficiency will not be adversely compromised that is efficiency also has to be taken into account now let's talk about the judicial interpretations regarding reservation the first case is state of madras versus champakam dorai rajan now before this article 15 sub clause 4 was not in the constitution and the state government provided for reservation for admission in the medical and engineering colleges but the court struck down that reservation in the admissions saying that only article 16 sub clause 4 provides for the reservation in appointments to the public services not in matters of admission therefore subsequently after a constitutional amendment 15 sub clause 4 was inserted into the constitution 
Then in MR Balaji versus State of Mysore case, the court observed that there should be a 50% limit on the reservations. Here, the State of Mysore had provided for 68% reservation and the court said that no, a maximum 50% of the seats can be reserved for the certain sections of the society, not more than that. Then in T. Devdasan versus Union of India case, the court had observed that there will be no carry forward rule. After this judgment only article 16 sub clause 4b was inserted into the constitution which provided for the carry forward rule. Then in State of Kerala versus N. M. Thomas case in 1976, the court observed that the 50% limit which was prescribed by Balaji versus State of Mysore also, that is not an absolute rule. That 50% ceiling which is provided in the reservation, that is only a rule of caution. Now after this, in 1979, the government appointed the Mandal Commission. Now the duty of Mandal Commission was to identify the socially and economically backward classes in India and to recommend a reservation policy. The recommendations of Mandal Commission were subsequently challenged in court in the case Indra Sani versus Union of India in 1992. Now what did the court observe in Indra Sani case? This is the very important case where the 50% ceiling was actually put into place officially by the Supreme Court. The court first observed that the Article 16 subclause 4 which enables the government to provide for special provisions for the advancement of socially and economically backward classes. This is not an exception to Article 16 subclause 1. Article 16 subclause 1 provides for equality in the matters of public employment which is to be ensured by the state. The court observed that the Article 16 subclause 4, it is ensuring substantive equality. This is actually ensuring equality in the broader aspect. But this reservation cannot exceed 50%, otherwise it will be impacting the administrative efficiency which is sought to be ensured by Article 335 of the Constitution. At the same time, the court observed that the privileged classes, they have to be excluded. That is the creamy layer concept was also put into place. The court observed that if the privileged sections, they also get the benefit of reservation, then the very essence, the very philosophy behind that policy of reservation will be lost. And the court observed that this will not be applicable in the case of promotions. Therefore, reservation in promotion was not allowed by Indra Sani versus Union of India case. And the court also laid down certain indicators to ascertain the backwardness, to ascertain whether a particular community, a section of population can be treated as backward classes for the purposes of providing reservation. Then in M. Nagras versus Union of India case in 2006, the court again said that these are constitutional requirements, the requirement of 50% ceiling, the requirement of creamy layer and there should be compelling reasons for the state to provide for reservation. Those compelling reasons are the parameters which the state is to take into account while providing reservation. They include backwardness, that is the community, the section, it should be backward. And there should be inadequacy of representation of that section in the public services and the administrative efficiency under Article 335 that should not be compromised. Also in R.K. Sabarwal versus State of Punjab, the court had observed that the people belonging to reserved category, they can also be appointed against the general category post provided they are fulfilling all the other criteria, that is the merit related criteria, if they are having suffic sufficient marks, etc. They cannot be denied appointment only on the basis that they belong to a reserved category. Now, in Ashok Kumar Thakur versus Union of India case, the court observed that the for providing reservations to SCs and STs, there will be no creamy layer. And the court also upheld Article 15 sub clause 5 which was inserted into the constitution through the 93rd Constitutional Amendment Act. Article 15 sub clause 5 provides for the reservation in private educational institutions which can also be required by the state governments etc. Then in Jarnail Singh versus Lachmi Narayan Gupta in 2018, the court observed that reservation in promotions do not require the state to collect quantifiable data on the backwardness of SCs and STs. The requirement of collection of quantifiable data to classify a community, a section, 
a cast as backward class etc it was put in the m nagraj case then in dr jayshri lakshman rao patel versus the chief minister 2021 the maratha reservation was also quashed the maharashtra government had provided for 12 13% reservation to the maratha community over and above the 50% ceiling the court in this case observed that no such exceptional circumstances which were envisaged in the indra sani versus union of india exist in the present case therefore the maratha reservation was quashed then in 2019 the central government had also put into place 103rd constitutional amendment act as per which 10% reservation was provided to the economically weaker sections of the society this was upheld in the case janhit abhiyan versus union of india in 2022 now what did the court observe here the court observed that the ews they can be treated as a different class and the ceiling 50% ceiling that is for backward classes the economically weaker sections they are a different class altogether and this 50% ceiling also this is not inviolable for the times to come as a society matures and evolves even our constitution is also a living document then as circumstances change then policies also have to change but a counter opinion the minority judgment also observed that it may serve like a gateway for further infractions therefore we have to take a cautious approach when we are breaching that 50% ceiling set by the supreme court in indra sani case otherwise it may result in reverse discrimination it may result in a feeling of resentment among the unreserved categories also there are other exceptions also for the 50% quota ceiling one is the 76th constitutional amendment act as per which the tamil nadu reservation law was inserted under article 31a in the 9th schedule to the constitution and therefore it is beyond the judicial purview also the maratha reservation provided for more than 50% reservation to marathas but it was subsequently struck down by the supreme court now the next article is related to stubble burning the context behind it is that the supreme court has directed the states of punjab haryana up and rajasthan to immediately stop crop residue burning as it is contributing to more air pollution smog etc in delhi this is important in gs3 climate change now before moving on and talking about the reasons and impacts let us look at some data how much the crop burning crop residue burning is contributing to smog or pollution in delhi first an iit kanpur study in 2015 had observed that 17 to 26% of particulate matter in delhi winter is coming due to crop residue burning also there is a green shoot also from september 15 to october 22 there have been about 1800 farm fires in punjab this year whereas last year the number was about 3600 so the number of farm fires the incidence of stubble burning they have come down by 50% in punjab as compared to last year and the year before that it was even higher around 4300 as per safar also which is an indicator to measure air pollution in delhi 40% of the contribution to air pollution is by stubble burning during the peak season of stubble burning that is during the months of october and november now this stubble burning contributes to more smoke because this is the season when there is temperature inversion also in the region of delhi because of winter nights clear sky and continental kind of climate and the temperature inversion traps this air pollution such as smog near to the ground now what are the reasons behind the stubble burning why do farmers resort to it one it facilitates the seed bed preparation and seeding and therefore it makes the soil prepared for further seeding and it is quick and cheap you don't have to invest anything because the turbo seeders happy seeders etc they are still quite expensive and when we look at the input cost for agriculture they have skyrocketed in the recent years and therefore farmers are even more reluctant to invest in such technologies which can sustainably take care of the crop residue therefore they resort to burning of it now what are the impacts of stubble burning the burning of crop residue when we look at it from the side of environment it leads to immense pollution in the form of carbon monoxide methane release of volatile organic compounds 
and when we look at the situation in November particularly in the northern region there is situation of temperature inversion and the PM10 and PM2.5 their concentration goes up significantly and the air becomes hazardous. When we look at the impact on soil health there also there are negative impacts too for example the nutrients are lost. The organic carbon content that is lost, the microbes, they are burnt during the fires and it leads to lower nitrogen and carbon content in the soil. Nitrogen and carbon are important for ensuring healthy root development of future crop plants etc. The impact on humans is also adverse. It leads to diseases like skin irritation, neurological diseases, respiratory illnesses and ultimately reducing life expectancy etc. Now, because of the fertilizer subsidies and electricity subsidies, etc., the crop yields have been increasing. Therefore, we keep on resorting to the same crops. We are not going for crop diversification or sustainable agricultural practices which could have taken care of such a problem. Now, what are the steps which have already been taken to take care of stubble burning? One, there is a scheme by the central government. It is the promotion of Agricultural mechanization for in situ management of crop residue. According to this scheme, if a farmer buys any machinery to take care of the crop residue, then 50% of that amount which is spent on that equipment is provided as financial assistance from the side of the government to the farmer. And if the machinery etc. that is bought by farmer producer organizations or cooperative societies, then 80% of the amount is provided for that machinery cost as financial assistance from the side of the government. Those machineries may include happy seeders, turbo seeders or combine harvesters or zero till seed drill, mulchers etc. Such are provided. When we look at the funds release about 3000 crore has been provided by the central government to five NCR states in the past five years. And there is a PUSA decomposer also which is developed by the IARI, Indian Agriculture Research Institute. What is a PUSA decomposer? This is actually a bioenzyme which is developed to convert the crop residue into compost. This is a fungi based liquid solution which makes sure that the hard crop residue it is softened and ultimately it is turned into compost, manure etc. And it is very cheap too. Hardly 4 capsules, they cost about 20-25 rupees and they can be diluted in 25 liters of water which can be used over a hectare. So it's quite cheap but it takes about 20-25 to 25 days to completely turn that crop residue into manure. Then there are some steps which are taken by the Punjab government also. It proposed to give 2.5k that is 2500 rupees as cash incentive to the farmers per acre if they do not resort to crop residue burning. There have been awareness camps which were conducted. The deputy commissioners they held meetings with farm union leaders to encourage people not to resort to stubble burning and there were promotions of ex situ management of crop residue for example biomass handling units were engaged and brick kilns they were mandated to use stubble as fuel. Now what can be the way forward more suggestions for this? One we can resort to alternative farming practices for example zero tillage, crop diversification and direct seeding. Ultimately this will reduce the crop residue which is left and we can promote harvesting machinery for example combine harvesters they cut the crops from a very low level from the ground and therefore less amount of crop residue is left and awareness campaigns can be held the crop residue it can be used as animal feed it can be re recycled for example it can be used to make paper cardboard etc or it can be used as manure or power generation we can use it for charcoal gasification etc or it can be used as raw material for bioethanol and pelletization can also be done what is pelletization essentially it means drying that crop residue and converting into pellets and mixing it with coal and it can be used as a source for power for burning it there is a model in Chhattisgarh also in Chhattisgarh what happens is about 5 acres of land that is dedicated for it, it is owned by the village, there the crop residue is collected and the cow dung is mixed with it and a mixture is ultimately forming an organic fertilizer which is again used for 
ensuring more crop productivity etc and there can be improved seed varieties for example pusa basmati etc such varieties can be developed in future too coming on to the next article this is related to the import of russian oil the context behind it is that indian refiners are estimated to have saved around 3 billion dollars in the first half of fiscal year 24 through their purchases of cheap and discounted russian crude oil this is important in gs3 also in reducing current account deficit for example indian economy planning and related issues and in gs2 also effects of policies and politics of developed and developing countries and its impact on india now before moving on and talking about oil imports from russia only let us look at the oil imports which we do from various countries and how that situation has changed over a period of time we import about 85% of the oil needs of india and therefore we are depending upon imports when we look at the previous oil imports iraq used to be our top most supplier then it was saudi arabia but if you observe from 2020 to 2023 the share of russia has increased immensely and if we observe the current fiscal in the first half of this current fiscal from april to september particularly russia has become the number one crude oil supplier for india giving maximum oil to india and the second place is occupied by iraq and third by saudi arabia let us look at the imports and exports of various products from russia also because we want to talk about the current account deficit too with that we are importing petroleum oils from russia fertilizer sunflower oil newsprint etc mainly from russia and what are we exporting to russia pharma products crustaceans tea and coffee etc now coming back to the oil imports european union and various western countries they have alleged that by buying russian oil india is indirectly even funding the ukraine war too there have been such allegations and india has been alleged to even have become a laundromat a laundromat means that india is importing cheap russian oil it refines it because indian refinery capacities are huge and we can refine it cheaply and then we export it again to the european union but the fact is for example 6 months back or some time back even our foreign minister observed shri s j shankar that this is not true entirely this picture is not the entire picture for example europe probably imports more oil from russia in an afternoon than india does in probably a month but that is uh, some time back a few months back now indian imports of russian oil have skyrocketed quite a bit but this laundromat tag that is not true because even europe is heavily dependent upon russian oil too therefore now it is buying oil through india after india refines it and then it blames on india now when there was russia ukraine war the situation changed ever since the february 2022 after the february 2022 sanctions were imposed by the west on russia therefore the west was not directly able to purchase oil from russia whereas europe is heavily dependent upon russia for its energy needs during winter especially for example the nord stream gas pipeline now let's talk about the reasons why india is increasing the oil imports from russia one it is lucrative it is obvious for example the per capita income in india it is hardly 2000 dollars whereas in europe it is 60000 euros so Europe takes care of its population before making decisions before buying energy or before buying oil gas etc from various countries so why shouldn't we take care of our population we are yet a developing country therefore we need cheap and affordable energy we need to take care of our current account deficit therefore we need that cheap oil and then we want to diversify our energy sources also For example when we look at the west asia there are at times regional conflicts sectarian conflicts and wars in the west asian region therefore we have to diversify the sources of our crude oil the oil which we are importing and when we look at the west asia they are even charging an asian premium the oil that they sell to asian countries they are charging extra for that there is cartelization which happens in opec therefore if russia decreases the prices of its oil 
because it wants to ensure that its economy is running smoothly in the aftermath of Ukraine war. If it is giving cheap oil to India, India would go ahead and buy it. Then when we consider the geopolitical considerations, the wars in future, they might be actually energy wars. For example, that Nord Stream gas pipeline through which Europe imports gas from Russia, that may have been a factor in accentuating the Ukraine war too. Then th we have a strategic partnership, we have to take care of it. With Russia, we have to engage based on issues, based on that interest-based diplomacy. And there are often global shocks and inflation. We have to counter those and to counter those, we need diverse sources and cheap sources of oil and energy. Now, what is the way forward actually? We should target not only oil imports. We have to diversify our energy sources. We should go for a sustainable energy mix. Not only oil, not only fossil, but non-fossil fuel based energy sources also. Renewable and non-renewable energy sources. We have to diversify our energy sources in the long run for it to be sustainable. And we have to explore the alternative sources also. For example, the national policy on biofuels, etc. Promote bioethanol so that at least some amount of oil can be produced locally and ethanol can be used for blending with petrol. And biodiesel, we can explore the gas hydrates in the Indian Ocean region near our coast, etc. Or we can explore newer ideas, for example, promotion of renewable energy, promotion of smart grids, and promotion of farmers or normal consumers as the energy producers also, where they become like energy preneurs, where if any extra energy is produced locally, then that can be absorbed by the smart grids. Now coming on to the next article, this is related to DISCOMs, that is distribution companies in the power sector. The context behind it is that a show cause notice have been issued to two DISCOMs by the Delhi Power Department over pending dues and subsequent charges. This is important in GS3 in the topic infrastructure and energy. Now power is a concurrent subject. Therefore, electricity, supply and distribution, this is mostly handled by the state governments and most of the DISCOMs, they are actually owned by the state governments, although there is an exception also, a few exceptions, for example, in Delhi, Mumbai, etc., the DISCOMs, they are owned by private distribution companies too. Now, what are the challenges first which are faced by the DISCOMs, the distribution companies? One, they often incur heavy losses and there are pending debts also. Losses to the tune of 50,000 crore annually and pending debts to the tune of 6 lakh crores as of now. Plus there are high aggregate transmission and consumer losses and these losses are in the form of energy loss, thefts, inefficiency in billing, defaults, etc. And these at &C losses in India, they account for almost 18 to 19 percent of the losses of the power. Whereas in the Western countries, in the globally, the average is about 6% or so. Therefore, the AT&C losses, they have to be brought down. Plus, there are low tariffs. And these low tariffs are often driven by populist measures which are taken by the state governments that they cannot charge high tariff from the regular consumers, from household consumers. Otherwise, there will be a feeling of resentment. And at the same time, there is poor subsidy support also from the side of state government. This leads to a poor financial health. And this poor financial health is accentuated, exacerbated by cash collection shortfalls. This leads to payment arrears. And this further leads to operational debt. This operational debt is serviced by borrowings and subsidies. And when the discounts they are running on operational debt, that borrowing cost is passed on ultimately either to the consumers or it has to be borne by interest, further borrowings, etc., which leads to a vicious cycle and poor financial health of discounts. There is a lack of metering also. Even six years after the Uday scheme, Uday was for the restructuring of the discounts in India. At various levels of the distribution chain, there is lack of metering. And when there is a lack of metering at various levels, it is difficult to find out where the losses happen. The loss making areas, they are difficult to be identified. At the same time, there is gross subsidization because there is low tariff which is charged from the household consumers. Therefore, gross subsidization happens between the industrial and commercial users. 
and the industrial and commercial users they are charged more and that subsidy is given to the household consumers which leads to high energy prices for the industrial and commercial consumers leading to higher costs of production etc and the alternative sources of energy when they are coming in then the industrial consumers they resort to them also therefore the resultant cross subsidy which was supposed to come from the industrial consumers that also declines leading to further poor health further decline in financial health of the discounts what is the way forward for that we can go for a discom restructuring we can promote more higher private sector participation in the distribution sector uh, private companies can participate it and there have been some successful examples also for example the atnc losses in delhi mumbai etc for some companies they have been brought down from 50% to about 10% also and it will lead to more efficiency in the distribution sector there can be regulatory reforms which can be taken up for example the depoliticization of the state electricity regulatory commission state electricity regulatory boards etc and operational reforms have to be taken up to reduce the atnc losses billing losses have to be brought down and that billing efficiency will be improved when there is a universal implementation of the smart metering etc and renewable energy can also be integrated to accommodate the generators also and prosumers also prosumers are those which are electricity producers also and they are electricity consumers to whatever extra electricity they produce that can be absorbed by the smart grids then the electricity amendment bill 2021 provides for the delicensing of the power distribution this will lead to the reform which is needed in the power distribution sector and it will reduce entry barriers and improve competition levels in the sector when there is more competition when there are more number of players in the sector ultimately it will benefit the consumers because they will have more choices or we can go for the creation of a national power distribution company if there is a national power distribution company then the procurement price for it will be lower because it will be able to negotiate better with the with the producing companies that is electricity producers and when the procurement price is low then naturally the financial health will improve or we can go for alternative measures like a low cost solar panel manufacturing industry etc these suggestions also can be given coming on to the next article this is related to the massive displacement in congo the context behind it is that as per the united nations international organization on migration almost 7 million people have been internally displaced in democratic republic of congo including a million in the eastern province of north kivu due to conflict with m23 a rebel group m23 is movement day 23 mass group which is a rebel group in the eastern province of congo now this is important in gs2 also and gs4 also and sa also you can narrate it like a story because it is an example of ethnic intolerance lack of inclusive governance and regional tensions etc this can be used in multiple papers let us look at the map of congo and understand the reason around it first for the from the prelims point of view let us look at the neighbors of congo congo neighbors zambia angola atlantic ocean republic of congo central african republic south sudan uganda rwanda burundi and tanzania these are the neighbors of congo the reason of interest for us today is the eastern province which includes the north kivu and south kivu these are the bordering regions with rwanda now let us look at the story behind the present conflict in 1994 there was a genocide in rwanda that genocide was the ethnic hutus hutu extremists killing a minority ethnic tutsis a million tutsis were killed and non extremist hutus were also killed that was the rwandan genocide in 1994 now this was also a factor in the civil wars in congo in 1996 and 1998 further this kept on increasing the insurgency contributing to insurgency in the eastern drc that is the kivu ituri and tanganyika region and the region which borders rwanda 
There are about 120, even more than 120 insurgent groups in the region, including M23, Movement Day 23 Mass, and the ADF, etc., Allied Democratic Forces, which has even pledged allegiance to Islamic State in 2019. And therefore, this is a big matter of concern. This is based in Uganda. Now, why there is violence? Why that region is experiencing disputes? One, there is violence over the territorial and natural resources. There is violence by the extremist militias. There are different militia groups in the region and they fight with each other over territory and natural resources which are there in the region. Congo, the Congo region also has lithium mines etc too. Then there are extrajudicial killings by the security forces too which leads to protests and resentment among the people and there are tensions with the neighbors. Particularly Congo has tensions with Rwanda because there are accusations by Rwanda that Congo is housing the Hutu rebel groups which were actually those people which fled Rwanda when there was genocide and they are like a rebel group operating from within Congo also. And the when we look at the efforts for ensuring peacekeeping then chiefly there are two forces. One is the East African Community Force and the other is the UN peacekeeping force. But often there are protests against the peacekeeping forces also and people say that this insurgency, this has continued unabated and the peacekeeping forces, they have also not been able to control it. So they should also leave the country, Congo. As per the World Food Program, about a million people in Congo, they are in dire need of food and they are almost starving. That is the situation in Congo. Now, what are the reasons behind it? One is the ethnic tolerance and insurgency. Now, why there is ethnic intolerance and insurgency in the region? Because the Hutus who fled Rwanda and entered into Congo, because they were fearing persecution in Congo, therefore they established their militia groups in the eastern part of Congo. And after this, the Rwandan Tutsis, they also initiated their own militia groups and the entire region, it got infested with so much insurgency and so many militia groups fighting among each other, which is leading to more and more ethnic intolerance and further conflicts. Then there is political uncertainty also and lack of inclusive governance. For example, the elections are due now in Congo, but free and fair elections, whether they can be conducted, that is also a concern. Also, there are several ethnic chiefdoms which are recognized by the Congo government around the periphery of Congo. And there, there are continuous struggles for power, struggles for representation and struggle for resources in the region. Therefore, there is no inclusivity in the governance and hence it leads to resentment, further conflicts, etc. And also there are armed groups the various rebel groups, they are acting like the proxies of various countries. Like the rebel groups in Rwanda, they are like the proxies of Congo. And the rebel groups in Congo, they are like the proxies of Rwanda. So these, this situation has to be taken care of. Thank you.